Greetings everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that this day finds you, your family, friends, and loved ones in great health. We thank our great God for blessing us that we can convene together by way of social media. So let us go before the throne of grace in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful that you've blessed us once again here today, that we could convene together and study more of your word. We pray that you'll bless us as we move forward in learning more about you and what you've taught us, Lord. We want to know everything that we can. We pray that you'll bless this, this Bible study, help us these words to go forward with power and might, help us to use this knowledge and information to glorify you, help us to inculcate it into our very being, Lord, and help us to use it as we go to and fro in the world. Take control of everything that is said and done during this Bible study today, Lord. And bless us that we will please you in all that we do. So we just give you all honor, glory, and praise. We commit this Bible study into your capable hands. We thank you, pray to you, and ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And we say, Amen. So the last time we met, we talked about death. And we talked about how death is the process by which God brings us into eternity with him. We said that when a Christian dies, his, body, his spirit and soul leaves the body and goes to God. Angels are there to escort us into the presence of the Lord the moment we leave our body. The body is the only thing that dies and the body is left behind to go into the ground, into the grave. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. Now, uh, that's for Christians. But what about those who are not Christians? What happens when they die? Well, angels also escort them into another place, a place called Hades. Hades is a, a holding place, a holding cell. You might think of it as a, as a person who's been arrested and he's in jail awaiting his trial. So the people who die, uh, that are not saved, they're escorted into Hades and that's where they're held until the great white throne judgment where they will go into a place called hell which is the final destiny for those who are unsaved so what about this hell this is what we are going to talk about today now a lot of people do not talk about hell a lot of churches don't a lot of pastors don't because it's, that's not our goal that's not where we are going but it, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven how about that he spoke more about hell than he did about heaven in the Bible, in the New Testament. So it's incumbent upon us to learn about hell so that we can use this knowledge and information as an evangelical tool and also so that we can be aware, we can teach others and let them know uh, what is in store for them if they do not accept Jesus Christ. Not to try to scare them into to coming to Christ for fear of being punished in hell, but that works too, if that's the reason they're going to come to Christ, whatever it takes them to come to Christ. But we want them to be aware of, of the love of God uh, and how God really operates and what he has in store for us all. Those who are saved as well as those who are not saved. So let's look at our first scripture today. We're going to look at one or two scriptures, how Jesus talked about hell and how the Bible talked about hell. A lot of people believe that there's no hell at all. But uh, actually there is. So let's get, get grounded here in this. And we're going to see that there's a hell. So if you look at the first scripture here, Matthew 10 and verse 28. Jesus was talking to his disciples. And here's what he told them. He said, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body. Where? in hell so we know that there's a hell now when he said destroy both soul and body that does not mean that the soul can die what it means is that the soul would be in everlasting punishment or everlasting destruction uh, so it's it doesn't mean that it, the soul will die the soul and spirit never dies as we talked about last time but what we are saying here is there is a hell and we want you to see that Jesus made this abundantly clear Let's look at another scripture where Jesus talked about hell. This is a very favorite one in Luke 16. This is uh, the parable of Lazarus, Lazarus and the rich man. And let's just read this for a moment. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. The rich man also died and was buried in hell. 
in hell where he was in torment. Nowhere, notice where he went. In hell. So there is a hell. He, uh, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. So he is in hell, he is in the fire, he is in agony. He tells Abraham to tell Lazarus to just give him some water, put some water on his tongue because he is in agony. So what we are trying to show you here is that hell does exist. It is a very, very real place. And Jesus taught it, as I said, he taught more about hell than he taught about heaven. But let's look at one more scripture to see that there is a hell. And we'll take this in from the uh, Revelation. Here's what John said in the book of Revelation. Revelation 19. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs, he had, he had deluded those who had re Received the mark of the beast and worshiped the image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The fiery lake of burning sulfur is hell. That's the false prophet and the antichrist right at the end of the seven year tribulation, just be, before the 1000 year millennial reign started. The antichrist and the false prophet are both thrown into hell. So we see. Three scriptures there that show us that there is a hell, hell is real, and there is a fire there. Uh, so we'll talk more about the fire in a moment. But um, what we're trying to emphasize here is that hell is real because we've, come, we've learned that uh, there are some people, Christians and non-Christians, who really don't believe there's a hell. They think that hell, hell is right here on earth. Well, in some ways that may be true. We can go through some very difficult times here on earth as I'm sure we all have experienced. However, this is nothing compared to the hell we are talking about and what Jesus was talking about in the gospel. This is completely different. So let's just talk then a little bit about the nature of hell itself. The nature of hell. First of all, hell is described, this is how Jesus said, it's being lost in the dark forever. I mean, you can't see anything, it's just dark. Can you imagine being in darkness forever? There is no light. And the reason they're dark, because Jesus is the light of the world. But you've separated yourself away from him, so you're in darkness. Darkness forever. This is one of the ways Jesus described hell. Hell is also described as a wandering star. Now, a wandering star. What is a wandering star? A wandering star is useless. It's meaningless. It doesn't, it doesn't serve any purpose. A normal star gives light. Uh, if a person is navigating on the sea or even the desert, and they can look at a normal star and they can trace that star. That star can give them direction into where they are going. But a wandering star, it just flashes across the sky and burns out. No light at all. Well, that's how hell is. You're just there. You know, you're, not, you're useless. You got no meaning at all. You, except in this case, you don't burn. You don't burn out. You don't go. This is forever. You're just wandering forever. Also, the same is with a water, a waterless cloud. Jesus described hell as a Jew would rather describe hell as a waterless cloud. Now, a waterless cloud is also useless. Because clouds give water. If they give water, water's for life. Everything that has life needs water. You must have the water in order to survive. But a waterless cloud, it has nothing. And that's how hell is. You are absolutely nothing, useless, no good for nobody or anything at all. You're just there, suffering. Let's continue on. This is what you would say. It. Now, let's continue on and see. A perpetually burning dump. Hell is like a burning dump, just burning all the time. It doesn't, doesn't go out at all. It never ends. It just burn and burn and burn and burn. We'll talk about the doctrine of annihilation in just a moment. But this is uh, the nature of hell. This is how hell is, perpetually burning. Also, it's like a bottomless pit. You're just falling. you got this sensation of falling all the time, but never reaching the bottom. You just feel like you're falling, falling, going down, down, never reaching the bottom. That has to be a very devastating, terrible, awful feeling for anybody to experience. It's like an everlasting prison. 
Uh, you, you know you're not going to get out at all. You're there forever. <laughs> that's it. That and that that's you know you talk about seeing light at the end of the tunnel. You could go through a trial and you say, oh boy, next month this trial is going to be over. Uh, next week this trial will be over, or even next year the trial is go going to be over. But when you know it's everlasting, you know that there's no way you're ever going to get out of hell. That's it. It's like an everlasting prison. You got no hope, nothing. It's everlasting. That's enough right there to just literally, literally, you will, a lot of people will want to die, but you're not going to die. That's what makes them worse. It's a place of anguish and regret because the, you're, the people in hell, they're going to be thinking about what they could have done, what they could have accepted Jesus Christ when they were living in this life, but didn't do it. So now they're angry. Who are they angry at? They're angry at themselves. Can you imagine being angry at yourself forever? And regretting what you have done or what you have not done forever and there's no end to it this is the nature of hell my friends and this is what uh, how the Bible describes hell and how Jesus described hell now let's continue on with the nature of hell it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth lots of crying lots of mourning lots of sadness lots of hurt lots of pain weeping and gnashing of the teeth this is a place where no human being or no, no animal would ever want to be. You just would not want to be in hell. This is not the place you would want to be. And the Bible explains it. And as we said before, Jesus talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. Which is why we are doing this study today. We want everybody to be aware. We'll continue with the nature of hell. Now, a lot of times we get the question, is hell a real, is the, is the fire real in hell? Is that a literal fire? Well, there is a real fire in hell, but it may, it may not be a physical fire. It could be quite differently than the fire that we know of. And the reason the theologians believe that this is hell is not the fire that we know of, because of the different type of expressions that are used in the Bible, different type of figures of speech that are used to describe hell. For example, they say hell is fire, but then it's, it's like it's, Jesus says darkness in, in Matthew. So fire brings light. So how could it be fire and darkness? So you got contrary views there. So those are figures of speech. Also, it, the Bible tells us it's like a bottomless pit. But then it says it's like a dump. A dump is not bottomless. A dump has a bottom. So you got two contrary views there. These are figures of speeches. It's like a, a bodiless soul is there. But then it has a tongue. You have a tongue, which is a part of the body. So these are contrary views. So we believe that hell, fi the fire is not real as we know fire today. But uh, the fire is real, but it's not physical as we know fire today. Now, that does not mean that the people in hell are getting away a little bit easier. What is happening here is Jesus and the Bible is using one of the worst means of torment that you could possibly imagine fire he's using that so we can understand how bad it's going to be because hell is going to be worse than the fire that he's describing in the bible hell is going to be worse whatever that fire is however it's designed it's going to be far worse than the fire we know of today that literally could torture and torment us that's what he's saying here. So uh, it's not the fire is real, but it's not necessarily not necessarily physical as we know fire today. That's the nature of hell. Now then, let's move to the next part. Where's hell located? Uh, sometimes we get that question as well. Uh, the Bible explains hell is under the earth. It didn't say it was in the earth. It said it was under the earth. How far down under, we do not know. But this is one of the reasons why you hear when people talk about hell. They say, you're going down to hell. Or even the Bible says down to hell. So we know it's down, just as heaven is up. The Bible explains heaven is being to the north. So we know that heaven is up. Hell is just the opposite, down. Okay, so we know that it's under the earth. It's a place of utter darkness. Like we said before, we just talked about that in Matthew 8, where Jesus said, it's out of darkness, you're dark because why? Jesus is the light of the earth, light of the world. 
But when you're away from Jesus, you have nothing but darkness. Just that simple. Away from Jesus, you got darkness. Okay. Heaven is outside of the city. In Revelation 22, John said, in fact, Jesus said this is going to be outside uh, of the city. That's away from God, away from the heavenly city. Remember we talked about the new Jerusalem? Well, this is the city we're talking about. Because there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be our home, as we talked about in a prior lesson. So uh, this is where uh, hell, those in hell are going to be outside of this, outside of the city. It's away from the presence of the Lord, of course, as we just said. Jesus is light. We go away from, people in hell are away from Jesus. And that's the scriptures there, Matthew 25, verse 41, and 2 Thessalonians, uh, we have there on your screen. Now, how long is hell going to last? We've seen Christians and non-Christians say it's no way in the world that hell could last forever and there could be a fire burning like that forever if we just don't believe that. Well, when Jesus was describing how heaven is, he said that he used the term everlasting. When he described how hell is, he used the term everlasting. And the Greek word used, ion, I, ionion, is the same word he used to describe the everlasting of heaven as with the everlasting of hell. So the same words. So hell then is going to last just as long as heaven lasts. Just as long as heaven lasts, that's how long hell is going to last, which means forever. Now some people believe that, uh, well, you know, it's only going to last uh, until uh, everyone is annihilated, until the body is destroyed and the people are destroyed. It's going to be. This is called the doctrine of annihilation, which simply says that uh, people who go to hell or every occupant of hell is just going to be destroyed. They're going to be annihilated, wiped out, killed, died, body, soul, and spirit, and so forth. This is the doctrine of annihilation. Well, this is not true for a variety of reasons. This is some, not anything that the Bible teach. Here's one of the reasons why. Uh, it's, not gonna, it's not annihilation because annihilation means that you're going to be destroyed immediately. It's immediate destruction. But we know that the, in 2 Thessalonians and what Jesus taught, hell is going to be everlasting destruction. Not immediate destruction, not where you're just going to be wiped out, you're going to die, and that's it. It's everlasting. It's never going to end. Also, uh, the beast and the false prophet were thrown into hell right before the millennial period start. The millennial is going to last for 1,000 years. Just before the millennial period start, the beast and the false prophet are thrown into hell. After the millennial, at the end of the 1,000 years, the beast and the false prophet are still there. When Satan is being thrown in the fire, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. So the, Revel so the beast and the false prophet are still there after 1,000 years. They're still being tormented in fire, in hell fire. So that means that you're not going to be annihilated. This thing is going to last forever. This is not going to end. Also, uh, the fire doesn't go out in hell. But with annihilation, the fire goes out. But Jesus said the fire is going to last forever. So we know right there, then, this whole thing about the doctrine of annihilation is just false doctrine. That's all it is. The Bible simply does not teach no such thing. And that's not uh, what we should have in our minds about hell itself, because it's just not true. Now, annihilation is not darkness forever. Because annihilation is wiping you out completely, destroying you. No, you cease to exist with annihilation. If you cease to exist, then you're not in darkness. You just don't exist. You're not there anymore. But a Jew would tell us that uh, you're going to hell is darkness forever. So right away we know that this whole doctrine of annihilation is just nonsense. And it's false doctrine or heresy. Who is going to be in hell? Now... Who's going to be in hell? First of all, we know Satan's going to be there. Uh, he's going to be thrown in hell at the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20 and verse 10. He will be in hell. There's just no doubt about it. Can't get around that. And the beast and the false prophet, which we just got through talking about. They're going to be thrown into hell 
uh, at the beginning of the millennial, at the end of the tribulation, that's the second coming of Jesus Christ. Not the rapture, but the second coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the seven year tribulation and beginning the millennial period. Uh, that's when the beast and the false prophet are going to be thrown in hell. So they are in hell as well. Also going to be in hell. Evil angels are going to be in hell. Now, evil angels, those are the angels that rebelled against God with Satan. In Revelation we read that one third of the angels rebelled against uh, God. They are going to be in hell. But even before that, those same angels, uh, some of those angels were... Uh, before the flood, some of those angels uh, rebelled against God then as well. Um, you, you may have heard the term Nephilim, Nephilim in the Bible. Well, what happened was in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, you'll see that some demons, these are fallen angels who had rebelled against God, they either made it with female humans as male, as men, or they either possess men, men, human beings, male human beings, and made it with women. And they had what was called Nephilim. The offsprings were called Nephilim. But never mind the Nephilim right now. The point is that these ones who rebel against God, the fallen angels, they will, they, uh, in fact, the Bible says they're in hell now. So there are some beings in hell now. That's these fallen angels, and we, we can read about it in Genesis chapter 6, uh, and uh, verses 1 through 4. But these, these, are, these are demons that are in hell now, which are called evil angels, uh, in some cases, or fallen angels. They're all demons, so they're in hell right now. So they will be in hell, so you got Satan in hell, the beast and the false prophet going to be in hell, fallen angels going to be in hell. And we've also got human beings. These are the human beings who rejected Jesus Christ, did not accept the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, and they are going to be in hell as well. So you've got Satan, the beast and the false prophet, you've got evil angels or demons, and you've got human beings, all who have rejected uh, God. That's every human being from Adam and Eve right up to the time of, uh, right to the great white throne judgment. All of those people will be in hell. Now, what about those who are unsaved? Where are they now? Are they in hell now? The answer is no, they're not in hell now. As we said earlier, they're in a place called Hades. Hades is a temporary place. It's a holding place. And they're waiting for the great white throne judgment. Those who, Everybody who goes before the great white throne judgment will go to hell. Everybody that goes before the great white throne judgment will, will go to hell. And that's um, the White Throne Judgment is found in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Does the Bible teach the doctrine of purgatory? Purgatory. Now, if you're a Roman Catholic or you're of the Catholic denomination, then you're very well familiar with the doctrine of purgatory. And the doctrine of purgatory simply says this. It says that when, uh, when, when you die, if you die and you're saved, then that's fine, but all of the sins you committed after baptism, you have to be purged of, or you have to be purified. Uh, this was a doctrine that was a principle in the Roman Catholic Church back in, in 1438. It was a principle then, but at the Council of Trent in the 1500s, they made it an official doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. And... Um, Right now, in the Catechism, in the Roman Catholic Catechism, it's an official doc, uh, doctrine there. So that's what the doctrine of purgatory is. The problem with this, this doctrine, again, here's what it says. You die, you're saved, but you have to pay for those sins that you committed from the time you were baptized before you could go, the, 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 the sins you committed after baptism before you could go into the presence of the Lord, before you could go into heaven. So you spend this time in purgatory being punished. Now, that is not what the Bible teaches. That's the problem with this doctrine. It does not, uh, the Bible does not teach such a doctrine. Jesus Christ has already paid the penalty for all the sins. We don't have to be in purgatory being purged or purified for any other sins. Here's what Jesus said when he was on the throne. Jesus made a simple, very simple statement. He said, it is finished. Finished. What's finished? He used the Greek word, 
of course, Jesus spoke in Aramaic, but the word there, the Greek word used for it is finished is to telestai. To telestai. It is finished. It's, he had paid the price for the sins of all mankind, past, present, and future. No need for purgatory. Why do, I, why do we have to continue paying for sins if it is finished? Also, Jesus said, I have brought you to glory. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you give me to do. John 17 and verse 4. So now we know that uh, he, again, he complete the work. He said, completing the work, he says. How can you beat that? I have completed the work you give me to do. So we know then that uh, there's no further need for us to, to have to pay a penalty, to be purged, or to be purified. Jesus is taking care of all of that. Also in Hebrews 10, it says, By one sacrifice, by one sacrifice, he has made perfect, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Perfect forever. One sacrifice. Not sacrificing again in purgatory or sacrificing more in purgatory. One sacrifice. He's already taken care of it. It's already over. So this whole doctrine of purgatory is not biblically sound. It's heresy and it's not supported by the Bible at all. It's not supported by the scriptures at all. Which is what we go by because that's what we are told to go by, the Bible. By the way, we will cover uh, how we know the Bible is from Jesus and we'll cover uh, how we know the Bible is complete in a future lesson when we get into some of our apologetic topics. The, uh, another question, why would God punish people in hell rather than reforming them? Well, actually, he's doing that right now. He's reforming us. This whole period of life that we live, three score and ten, you may live 70 years, you may live 80, you may live 90, you may live 100, you may live 15 years or 10 years. This whole period that we live is a part of the reformation. This is what he's trying to do now. He's trying to reform us. He's trying to reform us right now to keep us from going to hell. After the Reformation, after he's reformed us, we die. Hebrews 9, 27 says, It's appointed once for man to die, after that the judgment. That's when we are judged. Not to see if we are saved, but we judge to see if, uh, what our rewards are going to be. And once he reformed us, one, one thing about reforming, God can't reform us against our will. So this is why some people have to be punished. Some people will to be punished. They are determined that they're not going to accept Jesus Christ. They don't want to live his way. So you can't reform them. You can't make somebody love you. That's just not the way it works. Love has to be a choice. What if someone changes his mind after they get into hell? I'm sure you've probably thought about that question. At least I did when, uh, before I got into the studies of uh, Christian apologetics and Bible prophecy and theology and so forth. What if someone changes their mind? Well, this, lead, this lends to the question of the uh, character and nature of God, the attributes of God. One of the things we must always keep in mind is that God is omniscient, which means that he knows everything past, present, and future. God knows exactly who will accept his son, and he knows who will reject his son before we were even created. So he is never going to put somebody in the hell who will not, who would change their mind. That's number one. If he knows, he knows whether they're going to change their mind or not. And because of his foreknowledge, he's not going to send them to hell. Also, those who don't repent here, even though we have all the gospel being put out 24-7, the gospel is being put out. There's no excuse now at all. There's no excuse at all. 24-7 the gospel is being put up. Um, and they're not changing their mind now. So, what's going to make them change their mind later? Why would they change their mind at a later date? It's just not going to happen. They're not going to do it. 
So uh, it's, no one is going to change their mind after they go to hell. That's not going to happen. So you don't have to worry about that. Now, why, God, why doesn't God just save everybody? Just save everyone. There are some people uh, who believe that everyone is going to be saved. This is called universalism. The doctrine of universalism says all oh, people are going to heaven. God is going to save everybody. Well, we know that's not true because we've just read the, the one or two scriptures about, about people being in hell. And we've talked about those who are going to be in hell. So we know that he's, everybody is not going to be saved. Some people will be in hell, period. But why doesn't God just save everyone? Well, God gives us free will. Free will means that you have the, your, the ability to choose to love or not to love. You can love God or you can reject God. He has to give us the ability to do that, which we call free will, because you can't force someone to love you. Love is a virtue that must be chosen. You have to choose to love somebody. I can't make my wife love me. I would woo her and encourage her and give her flowers and and express my love to her and give her jewelry and diamonds and so forth because I want her to love me and I certainly love her and this is what I do even now to this day but I couldn't make her love me she has to had to make the choice to love me the same thing with us God can't make us love him he has to give us free will in order to for us to be able to make a choice you can't make a choice if you don't have free will, and you have to have, and he gave us free will. So once he gave us the free will, we could choose to love, but we could also choose not to love. But uh, God can't force anyone to accept, to accept him. Force freedom is a contradiction. If I force my wife to love me, it's not really true love. If God forces us to love him, it's not genuine, authentic love. And that's not the kind of love that he wants. That's not the kind of love that you would want. That's not a loving relationship. That's not a loving relationship at all. So that's why God just doesn't save everyone. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to be saved. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. However, he's doing everything he can, but he can't make us love him. He just can't. Love is a virtue that has to be chosen. In order for it to be chosen, you must have free will. Free will says you could choose to love, but you could also choose not to love. You choose not to love God, you just choose to hate Him. Just that simple. Okay, another question. Isn't it overkill to give eternal damnation for temporal sin? I mean, we are on this earth for a short period of time. We sin, or we don't accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's a temporary thing. So why would we have to experience eternal damnation? Why would we have to be in hell for all eternity? Well, first of all, you have to understand the nature of God again. God is eternal, which means no beginning, no end, outside of time, and cannot change. That's the etern eternality of God. That's how eternity is described as applied to God. Even though our sin is temporary and short-lived on this earth, to God, it's everlasting and it's permanent. So it's an eternal sin. Eternal sin requires eternal punishment. It's because of the nature of God that why, why we have to have eternal damnation. Also, uh, no sin can be tolerated as long as God exists. Again, he's eternal. God is also infinite, which means his being, God himself, has no boundaries and no limitations. So any sin against him has no boundary or no limitations. All sin is against God. So the sin is finite, but to God it's infinite. And because of God's nature, he has to give infinite punishment for infinite sin. He has to give eternal punishment for what is a, a short-term sin or temporal sin, but to him it's eternal sin. That's why he has to do that. And that's why it's not overkill from God's perspective. Okay, another question. How could we be happy in heaven if we know that we got a loved one down there in hell? 
You got a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, a son, a daughter, a cousin, a friend, or other loved one. They didn't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now they're in hell, we're in heaven. How on earth could we possibly be happy when, we, when they're crossing our minds? When we're thinking about them, how could we be happy in heaven? Well, first of all, let's get something straight. God made it very clear that uh, he is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. <laughs> There's going to be no more death, mourning, or crying. Revelation 21 and verse 4. So right away we know there's not going to be any sadness there. There's not going to be any hurt, no pain, no tears, no crying, no mourning, none of that. So God must be got something planned that he's going to do if he's not going to have any of that. Also, we know that we're going to have eternal pleasures. Psalm 16 and verse 11 said we're going to have eternal pleasures when we are in heaven with God. You can't have eternal pleasures if you're sad, if you're worried about somebody. So obviously God is going to do something. Well, what is he going to do? He didn't tell us. But here are a few possibilities. Here are a few possibilities. One, uh, God may purge our memories of all the loved ones that we had that did not make it into heaven. You have a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, anybody that we have that we love, they didn't make it. God could purge our memory of that person where we never did even know they existed. Never knew they were in existence. That's one of the things that he could do. And one of the things he may do. We do not know with certainty. We don't have scriptures to support this. But there, there are some scriptures that we can use to somewhat allude to it. We know we're going to be happy uh, in heaven. And there's going to, not going to be any tears or mourning or crying. So one thing he could do is purge the memory of any loved one. We wouldn't even know we had a son or a daughter. Or a mother or father or someone else who didn't make it. That's one of the things that he may do. Another thing. Once we are into the fullness of the kingdom. Once we have reached that last stage of salvation called glorification. We are glorified sense at that point. Now we're going to have a perfected spirit and we're going to see things from a divine perspective. We're going to see things like God sees them. And even though we know that that loved one is down there in hell, it's not going to bother us because we know that they got what they wanted to have. They wanted to reject Christ. They did and he gave them what they wanted. Thy will be done. He, that's what God said to them. That your will be done. That's what you want. And we'll see from God's perspective. That's another thing that will happen. Also, we have a perfect sense of God's justice. Because we're going to be perfect at that point. Once we have that perfect sense of God's justice, we know that they're being in hell, paying justice for just what they were supposed to be paid in hell. Uh, justified for in other words the punishment they're receiving is they're justified in receiving it and also there are the different degrees of punishment in hell the different degrees of punishment that doesn't make it any less because one person here is going to be uh, less punished than uh, one here that doesn't matter it's still in hell for all eternity it's a terrible place as we explained before but uh, but we'll see then that they are being justified for uh, what they've done, the works they've done here on earth. Now, why did God create people that he knew would be in hell? He knew they would go to hell. Why did he create them? First of all, God is love. God is love. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They didn't have to create anybody. God didn't have to create anyone at all. But because of his love, he created us, even though he knew some of us would reject his Son, he still created us. Now, you may understand this a little bit better when you think of a man and woman who got married. Because they love each other, they want to have children. So they have children. They want to express that love. They want to give that love to those young ones and raise them up in love and so forth. And they agree to have a child or children even though they know that some of those children are going to act like the devil. They know that some of those children are going to be very mischievous and very uh, rebellious. They know this. But they still make the decision to have the children. Why? Because have, giving love to some 
is better than having none at all to give love to. You see, just because all will not win the game does not mean that the game should not be played. Some are going to lose. God knew this, of course. Actually, God knew who would lose. <laughs> he knew who would accept his son and who wouldn't. Absolutely. But because of his love, he created us and he knew some would reject him. But he had to give free will so that they could love. And when they have free will to love, they also have free will not to love. So he knew this would happen. But because he knew that he wanted to share his love, he created human beings. Even though he knew some would go to hell. That's the answer to that question. Now then, is it just the same people of hell, even though these people can't help being sinners? They're born, you're born sinners. We all are born sinners. But so is it just the same as to hell? Because we, I mean, we can help being born a sinner. Well, first of all, there are two reasons people go to hell. When we, we are born with a propensity or a bet to sin. We are born with that. Yes. The other reason they go to hell because they choose to sin. You don't have to choose. They made their minds up to sin. Or to not accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. They want to sin. Even though they have the propensity. Uh, they are born on a road that leads to hell. But they also fail to take the warning signs while they are on that road to avoid hell. And God does everything he can in this life, while we're living this life, to try to keep us from going to hell. Uh, a person's sin nature does not force them to sin. It inclines a person to sin. Or as I said, we have a bent towards sin. Uh, we, um, we, 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 we have a propensity to sin. But we don't have the necessity to sin. We don't need to sin. We don't have to sin. We could, be, we could resist sin by the grace of God. Here's what St. Augustine said. St. Augustine said, We are born with the propensity to sin and the necessity to die. How about that? The propensity to sin and the necessity to die. But not the necessity to sin. We don't have to sin. We choose to sin. Sin is a choice. It's a choice. Why not annihilate sinners instead of tormenting them? For example, uh, animals who get hurt are trapped in a building and burned and they're going to die. and we, we end up killing those animals because we're taking them out of their misery. So why doesn't God just annihilate them and, and, and to, instead of tormenting them? First of all, number one, uh, we are not animals. So he's not going to treat us like animals. We're made in the image of God. That's number one. Number two is this. We are made in the image of God, and when God annihilates us, he's annihilating a part of himself. He's annihilating his own image when he annihilates us. So he can't annihilate. In fact, that's exactly why when God created us, when he created human beings, every human being, right from Adam and Eve, Right from that point on, when male and female come together, sperm and egg meets, and a new life is formed, that life never goes out of existence. It's intended to live forever. That's because we are made in the image of God, and God lives forever. No one goes out of existence once you're born. Once, you, once you're created, once that life is there, you don't go out of existence. Well, God is not going to annihilate us. Even the people in hell will be there for all eternity. They're not made to, he didn't make us to be annihilated or to go out of existence. He is eternal. He is infinite. He made us where we can live forever. Same thing. That's why he doesn't wipe us out of existence being made in his image. Now, uh, to annihilate those made in his image would be to attack himself, which is what we just got through saying. Isn't it cruel to torture people forever? Well, first of all, we've got to watch carefully when we use that word because the Bible never used the word torture when it talks about people in hell. It said torment. There's a difference between torture and torment. Torture is when your pain is being inflicted on someone unjustly. Torment is when you're being justly paid 
penalty for your sins. When the pain is being inflicted on you uh, justly. So there's a difference there. So the Bible never tortures anybody in hell. God never tortures anybody in hell. The Bible does not use that term at all. It says torment, and there is a difference. One is just and one is not. Isn't hell contrary to the mercy and goodness of God? God is a good God, a merciful God. Well, isn't hell contrary to How could he be good and merciful if he's going to put people in hell? Well, just because he put people in hell does not mean that he's not merciful. God is also just. And a just God has to punish evil. Well, he wouldn't be just. And as we said before, that's, what, that's why he put them in hell. God's mercy is not a passion or some kind of emotion that negates his justice. His justice is always there. In fact, all of his attributes are always there because God cannot change. Malachi 3 verse 6, Hebrews 13 and verse 8. He cannot change, so his justice is there. We look at the mercy, but we ignore the justice. But to be just, he has to punish evil. So if he's going to punish evil... That's why they're in hell. It's not, it has nothing to do with negating his mercy. He's still got mercy. So hell is not contrary, contrary to his mercy at all. If hell is what one chooses, what about those who don't want to be there? Those who don't want to be in hell. What about those poor people? Well, you know, people don't want to be there, but they will themselves to be there. Take, for instance, a drug addict. A drug addict doesn't want to suffer the negative effects of addiction, but he wills himself to start off taking that first bit of drugs. He chose to take those drugs at the beginning. Now, after he's hooked, well, then, you know, that's, he doesn't want that anymore, but he willed himself in the beginning. And that's how it is with us. You see, we reject Jesus Christ, not us, but those who reject Christ, they, you reject Jesus Christ, now you've paid a penalty, and you say, well, you know, I don't want this penalty, but you don't want to do anything to avoid it. You didn't do anything to avoid the penalty, so that's why you're there. Now, uh, there's a saying, the door of hell is locked from the inside, and, and, and here's what C.S. Lewis said about that. This was a very uh, 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 interesting take that C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis was a uh, uh, a British Christian apologist who's considered to be one of the greatest minds um, there ever was when it comes down to Christianity in, in, in Christian apologetics. But Lewis made a statement and he said, I willing believe that the damned are in one sense successful rebels to the end, that the doors of hell are locked on the inside. What Louis is saying here, the people who are in hell, they don't want to come out. They want to come out, but they don't want what's outside, which is heaven. They don't want heaven bad enough to leave hell. So they will themselves to be in hell. That's why he said the doors are locked from the inside. He said they're successful at that because they put themselves in there and they, they, they want to come out, but they don't want to do what it takes to get out which is accepting Jesus Christ. You see, hell for them would be in heaven. If, they, if you force them and put them in heaven, that would be hell to them because they don't want to live Christ's life. They don't want that good uh, divine life that we will be living with Jesus Christ. They prefer, but they don't want to be in hell either. But it's one or the other. So they will themselves to stay where they are. That's what happens when you're in hell. What about those who have never heard? And we've talked about this uh, in lessons before. Those who have never heard of Jesus Christ, you know, that Jesus is the only way. You have to come to Jesus. Well, God made sure that he revealed himself in what is called general revelation. This is the, uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, the creation itself, and nature. In Romans 1, it said that uh, his... Invisible qualities, his divine nature and eternal power is clearly seen from, uh, from, from right from, from here on earth. You can clearly see, so nobody got any excuse. No one got any excuse not to come to Christ or not to believe that there's a God. Because you can look at the creation and tell that. Also, uh, in their hearts, in Romans chapter 2, it said everybody has the moral law written on their hearts. So then, if that person looks at the creation and says, well, that got to be a God to put those stars up there. And he acts on that. 
on what he knows. If that person has in his heart the moral law and that person says, uh, I want to do what is right. I don't quite know what is right in every situation, in every circumstance, but I want to do what is right. And uh, once God sees that person do that, then God is going to draw that person to Jesus Christ. Uh, he's the only one that could do that. But what you're doing, you're acknowledging there's God. When you start living that way with the, from the general revelation, you're acknowledging there's God. God will draw you into a relationship with Jesus Christ, John 6, 44, and that's how you will be saved. So the people who, who, who uh, have never heard God, no excuse at all, because you've got to come to Christ and Christ and God the Father will draw you to it. Now we have some incredible stories about this. God has so many ways to reach people who are in some of the most remote areas of the world. Uh, in the jungles of uh, Africa or uh, South America or Central America or Asia, he has pulled some of these people out. I mean, literally got them out of there miraculously and got the gospel to them. And some of them, he got the gospel in there to them in miraculous ways. He got the gospel to them in some very... And, and there are so many stories about this. It's just incredible. If we look at Islam, for example, there are many Muslims that are being saved. You got other, some of the Muslim countries, for example, a lot of those people are being taken out of there in miraculous ways and being saved. And a lot of them are getting the gospel in different ways. Some of the stories are incredible. You see God hand in some of the stories. There are many of them out there. Uh, you could find some of them. Uh, I don't think we put them on our website, but there are a lot of the websites that you could find information how people are saved. But keep in mind, God knows exactly who will be who will accept the son and who won't. So he knows who to call. He, the person he knows they're going to accept the son, he will get the gospel to that individual. He will definitely get the gospel to that individual. No one will be in hell who should not be there. Everybody who's in there it should be there. Okay, let's continue on. I think number 16 is our last question. What are, oh, okay, yeah, this is what are the effects of being in hell? Uh, I think there are about 10 or 15 of these we got. So let me just run through these somewhat quickly here. First of all, we're separated from God and all of his glory. And we talked about that already. Jesus Christ is light. We're going to be in the darkness so because you're away from Jesus Christ. There are different degrees of punishment in hell. Now, we didn't go through this uh, in, in prior lessons, but we put the scriptures here so you can see them. Everybody in hell will be at different levels of punishment, just like everybody in hell will, in heaven will have different degrees of rewards. It's not going to be the same for everybody. You're rewarded according to your works. In hell, you're going to be punished according to your works or, or, or not your work, or your not works, if you want to put it that way. So there will be different degrees of punishment in, in hell. Also, hell is the final eternal state. There's no second chance. We know that there's some Christian religions that are teaching that you'll have a second chance. This is nonsense. It's heresy. It's not biblically sound. It's not backed up by the scriptures. Today is the day of salvation. No second chance. It's appointed once for man to die and after that the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. So there are no second chances at all. This is it. Hell is the final eternal state. Hell is a place of unquenchable fire. We talked about that already. The fire never goes out. It's burning, it's burning, it's burning. But if the fire is burning, then it has to have something to burn. What is going to be burning? The occupants of hell. So you get this whole doctrine of annihilation and hell is there's gonna, not going to be forever and all of that nonsense again. It's a place of unquenchable fire. It's also a place of memory and remorse, Luke tells us in Luke 16. Remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Okay, the rich man is saying, oh Lord, I am so sorry, please give me some water to put on my town. Too late. It's over. He's, he's, he has remorse. He's regretting what he did or what he did not do, which was not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's a place of thirst. You're always wanting water. Always. Can you imagine that? Thirsty all of the time with no end, nothing to quench your thirst. Just always wanting more and more liquid. Just like the, like the rich man told, just, just put your finger in, dip your finger in some water, just dip, put it on my tongue. Just that little bit. He was imagining that much could help him. 
but it's not a place. It's also a place of misery and pain. And we talked about that already. It's a place where we're going to where they are going to be uh, suffering misery and pain. Uh, it's also a place of frustration and anger. Frustration. Wow. Who are you frustrated with? Yourself. Why? Because you didn't accept Christ. But it's too late. So now you're angry. Who are you angry with? Yourself. Same thing. Frustration and anger, Jesus tells us in Matthew 13. It is a place of separation. Your separation from God. Your separation outside of the holy city. And that's for all eternity. No end at all to that. For permanent separation. It's a place of undiluted divine wrath. And hell is where all of the wrath of God is finally poured out. That's it. All of his wrath is there then at that point. And it never ends. Okay, no ending there. I can't emphasize that enough because as long as you're living here on, in this life, you have hope. Jesus Christ is our hope. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 1. Once you're gone, Hebrews 9, 27, that's it. So you got to accept Jesus Christ now. Don't wait until you die. Too late. Too late. Okay, let's continue. It's an eternal place. What we just got through saying, and we've said many times already, it's not going to end. It's forever and ever and ever. It was originally prepared for Satan and its horse. Hell is so bad, it's so terrible. When God prepared hell, he didn't prepare it for human beings. He prepared it for the devil and his demons. But anybody who wants to follow him will have to, God say, your will be done. If you want to follow him, then go ahead and follow him. So hell was prepared for Satan and his, and his horse. So that's all we want to say about hell. We want you to understand this. As I said, uh, most churches don't talk about hell. But Jesus talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. If Jesus talked about it, then we should be talking about it as well. So we want you to understand this. We want you to know this and what hell is about. And of course, I know that everybody in the sound of my voice or who are viewing this will not be in hell. We just know that. And so we, 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 we're going for the other place, heaven. With Jesus Christ, of course, with God the Father and the Holy Spirit and all of our loved ones. This is where we are looking to be. So uh, this is, uh, take these words with you. You can use this as an evangelical tool. Sometimes you have friends or relatives or other loved ones who uh, uh, may ask questions about it. At least you'll be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. And uh, also you could uh, let them know that they don't have to go there and that kind of thing. But at least you have an idea of what hell is like. You can understand what the Bible teaches about hell, which is what we taught here today. So let us... Take these words with us and let us go before the throne of grace. Father in heaven, we are thankful that you've blessed us that we can complete this Bible study today on hell. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for helping us to learn. We know, Lord, that this is a subject that is taboo for many, many people that uh, many don't want to hear it or don't want to talk about it. But we know that Jesus taught it and he talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. So we... Uh, uh, we are instructed to preach the whole counsel of God, the whole word of God. So we thank you for inspiring us to bring this lesson to all who will hear it here today. So we just ask that you'll help us to take these words with us and help us to use them to glorify you and to be a blessing to others. Help us to use these words uh, and to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us and to do it with gentleness and respect. We thank you, Lord. We give you all honor, glory, and praise. We love you. We worship you. We adore you. We thank you, pray to you, and ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And we say amen. So then again, brother, we thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. We could have this lesson. The next time we meet, meet we are going to talk about resurrections. Uh, there are two resurrections in the Bible, but they are broken down into seven. So we are going to talk about those, and we are going to explain each one of these resurrections. So try to be with us. We look forward to seeing you again. In the meantime, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. God bless.